Welcome to another episode of The Zach Hiley Show. Today, I have the honor of being with Jill, and Jill is from the larger Philadelphia area. She's a PGY3 at Jefferson in Internal Medicine, and she initially studied philosophy and psychology at the University of Scranton, and she worked in social services as a case manager after college. She then transitions to vaccine development NIH-funded research as a clinical coordinator at the University of Vermont while taking pre-med classes. She attended medical school at Penn State College of Medicine, where she also earned her master's in education and was recognized with the Leonard Tao Humanism in Medicine Award and the Gold Humanism Honor Society. During medical school, she also held multiple statewide and national positions, such as a chair for the Committee on Bioethics and Humanities for the American Medical Association Medical Student Section. Wow. Board of Trustees for the Pennsylvania Medical Society, State Director on Pennsylvania Political Action Committee Board of Directors for the Pennsylvania Medical Society. She she then served as an editorial fellow with the AMA Journal of Ethics in 2019, and she matched at Thomas Jefferson in Internal Medicine, where she was recognized with multiple teaching awards, including the Hobart Armory Hare Resident Teaching Award, Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Society, and Teaching Award and the Daryl and Moyer MD FACP Professionalism Award for Trainees in Southeastern Pennsylvania. She's interested in a career in academic hospital medicine and medical education crafting curriculums that incorporate health system science and humanism topics into medicine. So as I always start this podcast, I like to talk about a few statistics around internal medicine, and then we'll see if you have any insights or thoughts about them. So the average salary overall for all physicians in America is 339000 That's for attending physicians. 260000 is the IM average. The average hours worked a week for all physicians is 51, while internal medicine is 55 hours per week. Overall, 59% of physicians are happy compared to 54% internal medicine. 47% of physicians overall are burnt out with 48% in internal medicine. of all physicians say they would choose the same career again, while internal medicine doctors say they would only pick it 25% of the time again. The step two score average is 246, with IM being the same at 246. Now, it's interesting because I want to go into internal medicine, but when I see these stats, I'm scared. Do you have any thoughts on these stats? Yeah, it's tough, too, because I wonder if those stats are in the wake of COVID or pre-COVID, because internal medicine was really the front lines of COVID, right? Internal medicine docs uh, ran the ICUs. We ran the folks on the floor in respiratory distress. Um, So some of those statistics, if we're talking about it in the context of COVID, don't surprise me all that much. It was was tough time. I went through training um, my first year was peak COVID. But I am surprised to hear only 25% would pick it again. I wonder if that uh, how that breaks down into subspecialties because the beauty of internal medicine is that it's a really broad umbrella where you have really every organ specialty under it. And the generalist, which is what I hope to be, yeah, uh, really takes their knowledge of each organ system and how it interplays and oversees each specialist. So it would be curious if that's the same for every cardiologist yeah. or every GI doc. Yeah. Uh, falls into those statistics or if it breaks down differently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, it's, it's, it's crazy. I think it, it does break down a little bit, a little bit differently. Maybe GI does a little bit better, but this was after COVID. This it was, was post-COVID. Yeah. So that makes a lot of sense. And I remember looking at the statistics um, around emergency medicine. And emergency medicine actually has the worst burnout scores, but they jumped 20% from the beginning before COVID to I think there were 40% and then 60% after COVID. So the burnout has been been real, it's real tough, real tough. So thanks for that insight on the statistics. Tell me, what is internal medicine? So internal medicine is the study of each organ system um, and the interplay between them. So when a lot of people think of what a doctor is, this archetype of a physician, of someone wearing a long white coat working in a hospital, they're usually thinking of an internal medicine doctor. So think of your house or your JD from Scrubs. Those are internal medicine doctors. And then you can further specialize uh, from there into cardiologists, kidney doctors, or nephrologists, gastrointestinal doctors, or gastroenterologists. Um, So there's uh, uh, internal medicine is probably the widest breadth um, and probably covers the the broadest range of subspecialties that you can go from there. What I like about internal medicine is that um, those who stay general, who work exclusively in hospitals, which are called hospitalists and internists, um, they get to be managers of the team. 
Um, so they get to consult specialists, whether that's those specialties that I already mentioned, or whether that's even outside internal medicine. So surgeons, uh, neurologists, uh, whoever their patient needs to see at the time. And they ultimately decide what is best for that patient's care at the time, um, because they have the knowledge of the overall arching health of the patient, how everything is interplaying, and hopefully know that patient well to know what their personal health goals are and what they ultimately want and would be happy and find fulfilling in terms of their health. So that's that's what drew me uh, specifically to it and why I wanted to stay general because I wasn't willing to give up that really intimate relationship with the patient. And honestly, the, the control over... Um, how the subspecialties interact and making sure that I'm keeping that patient in the center of what their, and, and their goals in the center of what their health plan is. Mm. And you're applying to be a hospitalist, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. And that's, that's for p- those who don't know, that's a job, that's a full-time attending position, and you'll basically be the the boss in the hospital managing directly the patient's care, their whole care. It's of almost, course, going to consultants and things like this. But. Yeah, it's almost like the project manager of the yeah. team. And it's not just other medical specialties, right? Like the, the hospitalist also manages the social workers and the case managers in the hospital who arrange for safe discharges for these patients. So does this, this patient is healthy enough to leave the hospital, but are they healthy enough to go home? Maybe they need to spend some time in rehab uh, first to, to build back up their strength. Maybe they need to go to a specific drug rehab to, to work on the addiction medicine component of their health care. So all of that is also very important to their overall health. Um, and it might be because I used to work as a case manager and that's why I'm drawn to that. The I think the social needs of patients are just as important as their health needs. Um, so yeah, the, the hospitalist is really that person who can look at the patient's not just current health status, but where they're going. Mm. And I love that I'm talking to you because I, I speak to a lot of internal medicine residents and, you know, they're thinking of the next thing, uh, cardiology, gastroenterology. For those that don't know, usually for these specialties like cardiology, gastroenterology, nephrology, you can name hundreds more probably, you have to do your three years of internal medicine before. But you are going into the field that internal medicine trains you to be a good attending, a good hospitalist. So to back up even more, how did you know that you wanted to go into internal medicine? How did you decide? Well, I started medical school uh, really liking everything. I think that's part of the problem. You might be able to relate to yeah. this as someone who wants <laughs> yeah. to go into internal <laughs> yeah. medicine. I started off with a PEDS rotation. I'm like, ah, I really like PEDS. I like uh, I like overseeing the team. I like rounding, which is, I think, a big decider yeah. of whether big or not decider. you like rounding, big which decider. we could talk about yeah. what I mean by that. And then, um, and then I moved into OBGYN. I'm like, wait, I, I love women's health. I love this population. And then I moved into surgery and I love surgery. And then I moved into neurology. And it, it, that pattern continued until I realized I loved every aspect of people's care. I love talking to everybody. I don't mind calling specialists. I don't mind being not being the expert on something. I like that I can call an expert and learn from them and ad- admit that, hey, I need your help with this. This is what I'm thinking. Tell me what you would recommend. And learning from them and interacting with colleagues of different fields and in different walks of the hospital. And that, that screams a generalist and in general internal medicine. I probably would have been happy in any of these fields. The one thing I do miss a little bit is that while there's a lot of procedures in internal medicine, it's not quite the same as opening someone up, someone up and fixing it. But I could not um, I could not just do that and and then say goodbye. I mm. wanted to know where they were going and what was happening. And and that's why uh, this field really seemed to fit with my career goals. Yeah, it, and that's an interesting last statement you made because a lot of people are told in medical school, the first thing you need to decide is whether you want to be in the OR or outside of the OR. Mm-hmm. So you, it sounds like you made that decision fairly early. No, I love the OR. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I loved being in and yeah. out of the OR. I think a part of it was, um, well, I would have been very happy in the OR, and there's still aspects, and this is something as a medical student to yeah. hold on to because okay. it's the last time in your life or at least in your career, where you can move freely throughout the hospital. You could go to the delivery room. You could go to the OR. And I don't have a reason to go in an OR anymore. Um, So I do miss the OR, but I don't miss it enough um, to give up the things that I love about medicine. Um, 
I love that I get to sit down and think about how all these puzzle pieces fit together. I love that you really just intellectualize the human body and all the organ systems and make sure that everything's fitting together and spend a lot of time thinking about that. I love the hands-on nature of medicine, which there's less of it in internal medicine, but it's still there. Um, I also, the negative side of things, I did not want to do a five or to seven year residency. I was really ready to start my career as soon as possible to work with patients is soon as possible. And to, I started to crave more independence as soon as possible. So a five to seven year residency didn't really fit in with what I wanted in a career trajectory, which is important. Yeah, no, that's an important thing to think about. I want to point out two things because an important note to medical students is you do have that freedom as medical school. I think I didn't realize how much, hopefully at your school as well, wherever people listening are going to, the teachers care about you, right? If you go say, I really want to learn about gastroenterology, which I did, for example, they're like, you can go watch some endoscopies, go watch some colonoscopies. They don't care. They'll send you over there to help you out. Come to the endo suite and here, try the the scope. Yeah. See if you like it, which that's that exact thing happened to me as a student. Yeah. It was a lot harder than it seemed. It's insane. Yeah. And it's, I, I mean, I could seek those things out as a resident if I really, really wanted to. It's harder. I don't have as much time to do that, nor is it as relevant for me as I'm figuring out. But having gotten to do that as a student, for the folks that are listening that are in school, take advantage of those things. Like, because not only will it help you decide what you like and what you don't like, it will help you, even if you're in a completely different field, have an idea of what other people do on their day-to-day -day basis and what something actually looks like when you're describing it to a patient. Yeah, yeah. So for third-year students or maybe even second-year students, I like to try and pinpoint, I don't know if there was a moment for you when you said, okay, I'm definitely doing internal medicine. This is where I'm going to apply ERAS. Was there ever a moment for that? Like for me, for example, I kind of was thinking, I actually came into med school thinking psychiatry, and then I had an OBGYN experience. I was like, this is amazing. But that was my first clinical experience, so I, was, I, was, I didn't know what the rest of the clinical world was. And then I went to psychiatry, and I did neurology, and I was like, this is not for me. I know this isn't for me. And then I did internal medicine, and I was like, this is really cool, but I want to see the rest. Yeah. It was never a real moment for me until I finished my third year of medical school. And I was like, where do I like the people the most? Where do I think I would fit in the most? And it it was internal medicine. Was that similar for you or different? Yeah, I think it's tough because it's it's more fun to have like a, a big uh, epiphany moment. moment. Yeah. And I, I just didn't. Um, I Well, that's not true. I can think back to moments on rotations where I'm like, oh, this isn't quite what I had pictured in my head when I was learning about it. Neurology in particular, I, I really considered and mm. I loved it. And then when I was on a stroke rotation, I found it really frustrating mm. that there wasn't a ton of intervention. It was the the act of pinpointing the stroke, of diagnosis, of caring for people when they're at truly their most vulnerable moments was amazing. Mm. And the neurologists that I know are brilliant. But for me, it wasn't the, the majesty of picking the exact place in the brain or spinal cord where the lesion is and tracing that back based on your knowledge of anatomy wasn't uh, didn't quite line up with what I was actually seeing in the clinic day to day and what it actually meant to practice neurology. Um, so that kind of moment really did help me differentiate in between what I like and what I didn't like. But um, the, the thing that I think when I really started to think internal medicine is for me was at my medical school, we were really lucky to have multidisciplinary rounds um, that students went to. And we had social workers, case management, nurses, the attending, the resident and the student were all rounding together on patients. Um, and we do something similar at Jefferson, but I try to bring students with me to that so they have that experience, but nice. that's not usually something that no. happens. You might not. No, have, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of, it can be boring unless you have someone kind of walking you through mm -hmm. it. But I remember thinking how truly they were looking at the entirety of that person and not just an illness, not just what they're doing that day, but what do we need to do to get this patient to where they need to go, which is either home or a, a rehab facility or wherever. And I thought that was pretty special. It was the first time I saw that. Yeah, yeah. 
I, but you were a case manager, correct? I was, but not in medicine. Not in medicine. I okay. worked in developmental disabilities. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So okay. it was totally different. I, I see. It was mostly a crisis manager. So um, I worked a uh, night shift from mm-hmm. 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. And um, if the young adults in the, our nonprofit program for independent living, um, if they needed, if they were in crisis or they needed special supports, I was there overnight to help them with that, put them in touch with the appropriate, um, yeah, appropriate Got caregivers. Got it. So tell me about residency. What can you talk me through each year and say maybe the good things, the bad things, what you do? And this is help, very helpful for me, right? Because I mean, hopefully I'll match and hopefully I'll be starting somewhere in July. What should I expect? Yeah. So overall, for yeah. internal medicine residency, yeah. you're gonna see. Uh, a d- division between two major types of programs. One is a X plus Y model, mm-hmm. which means X is the time that you spend in on inpatient in the hospital services. Yeah, got it. And Y is the time that you spend in ambulatory practices, which is outpatient practices. Got it. Um, and you have usually four plus two or four plus four or something like that, where you spend a particular amount of time dedicated to the inpatient side and then kind of the the less rigorous schedule of the outpatient side. Um, or you have a traditional model, which is where you're pretty much consistently in the hospital, um, but get pulled to your continuity clinic a half day a week, every week. Mm. There's pros and cons to both of those things. I go to a residency program that is an X plus Y, which I tend to really like because the... X, the in the hospital, you could kind of put your head down and really dive deep into what you're doing at the time. Whether that's a specialty service, like a cardiology service, where I can really focus on the heart and learning that pathophysiology and the latest treatments in the field, or whether that's a general medicine service. Um, and then when I move to my Y block, my ambulatory block, I can kind of experience the diastole of residency, right? Mm. The refilling, um, kind of get my weekends off and enjoy a nine to five work schedule and really get to think about primary care models and health maintenance and what it means to work in an outpatient setting, which as an internal medicine resident, a lot of people have limited experience with. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's interesting. And I wanted to point out one other thing that you said in your bio, actually, that I'm going to pick on here. And you said you want to design a curriculum Mm -hmm. around health system sciences and humanism topics at medicine. Can you talk more about that? Why the impetus? Where's the impetus to do this? And why do you want to do this? Yeah, well, it's like, I think I included it in my bio because I'm interviewing for jobs. So I'm used to everybody (laughs) asking, like, what do you want to do with your career? (laughs) Um, I have no, definitely no input on hiring anyone. Yeah. So don't worry, safe space. <laughs> so I, um, I have a master's in education. Yeah. I have a humanities background and I have this case manager background where I did a lot of advocacy and policy work yeah. while I was working in that field. So I have kind of this windy road to get to, to medicine. And I realized that not a ton of folks have those kinds of exposures to what medicine is or the influences of um, kind of the ancillary topics of medicine outside of direct clinical training, meaning population health, public health, policy and advocacy. Um, Medical economics is also Mm. really important. And these are things that affect ours and our patients day to day. And a lot of clinicians kind of put their head down. They're like, well, I'm here to learn medicine. Well, that's great. But the reason why your patient is sitting here and can't get to their next steps on discharge is because of whatever policy has influenced like their ability to get care, whether that's their insurance coverage, whether that's what medications they can afford, whether that's what they qualify for um, on discharge. So I'm a firm believer that all of that directly affects patient care, whether or not we want to recognize it as clinicians. So Mm -hmm. making sure that's incorporated in some way into the medical school curriculum and residency curriculum is really, really important to me. Yeah. 
Yeah. And you also have another interesting about you've written two articles, interesting articles. And I know, unfortunately, there was a, a shooting at the hospital that you were working at. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Because I think it's an interesting experience that I think the writing has probably had a, a good impact, a helpful impact, because I don't think it's talked about much, right? Yeah. So uh, my second year of residency, I was working a night shift, as we do. Yeah. Um, admitting patients overnight. So anyone who comes into the ER overnight um, needs to get admitted to a medicine team. I admitted them and took care of them throughout the night. Um, in the middle of the night, we got called that there was some sort of incident on the ninth floor. And another role of the night residents, um, particularly the night float residents, are to respond to any emergencies that happen in the hospital, regardless of specialty. And so we got a call that there was an emergency. We went to it. It turns out that emergency was in uh, a shooting. And it was a hospital employee who shot another hospital employee. And we got really lucky that um, it was a targeted situation. Um, but at the time, it, it was quite scary. I mean, afterwards, we sheltered in place. Um, we were trying to put put together what was going on. You know, there were rumors flying around, just any other crisis situation. Um, so it was a bonding experience for those of us that were working that night. Um, you know, it was tough coming to work the next day, but that's part of medicine is that you're essential, you're needed. It was the same thing with COVID. You know, we it, it was tough days, but we needed to be there and we were doing important work. So um, yeah, it, it, I reflected on what it means in the context of burnout. Mm -hmm. I reflected on it and what it means in the context of the broader gun violence crisis in the country and in Philadelphia and the city. Um, because I, I think, I hate to say that this incidence opened my eyes to something I didn't see before because I was well aware of gun violence before mm -hmm. this happened. But certainly um, my patients experience it much more often and much more directly than I do. And it's really just trying to be another another voice um, in chorus with them, just trying to sing that the enough is enough. We have to do something about this. This is affecting all aspects um, of our lives now, work, home, um, and, and our ability to get medical care. And I'm just trying to be a voice that... Something needs to yeah. change. Let's go into happy, happier stuff. Yeah. So tell me about, um, like, what do you think is the best thing about being an internal medicine doctor? The best thing about being an internal medicine doctor is the residents and colleagues that you work alongside yeah. and students. Yeah. Um, it's getting to know your patient on a really personal level, developing a relationship with them. And it's um, getting, honestly, I love calling consults. I know yeah. that sounds crazy. <laughs> Sometimes I have to act like a mom when I'm, I'm calling so a consult. I'm so scared when I'm a medical student calling consults. I know. And I used to be too. Yeah. I used to be scared as an intern. Yeah. Now, as a senior on the team, if I get pushback, which has become more and more rare because you kind of know. The way to what, say it. Yeah, you know the way to say it. But um, if I get pushback. I kind of act a little bit like a mom. I'm like, is that really the nicest way <laughs> to talk to a colleague when we're just asking for help? It's, it kind of, it usually like kind of loosens up the yeah. situation. And just a reminder that like, hey, I'm calling because I don't know. Yeah. Like there's no pride here. Yeah. There's no hubris. I just am asking you for help and your advice here. Yeah. And i um, happy to listen to it if you have time to give it. Um. And it's, it's just, it's gotten a lot better. But once you kind of open it up and also another thing that helps that calling consults as a, like a senior resident versus a student is that I, a lot of the fellows in the hospital are people that I trained with. Mm, so they're I all see. like, a lot of them have become friends or they're people I've gotten to know well over time. So I have a friendly relationship with. Yeah. And that's really helpful because I get to, I get to be like, hey, listen, you don't have to see a patient right now. This is not an emergent thing, but what would you do in this situation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
And I've had. And this is called a curbside kind of thing, right? That could and be is a curbside. Cur- is it a is it a curbside with the true intention of a real consult? Is, is that what you're saying here? Or Sometimes. No? Okay. Depends. Yeah. <laughs> There's a little bit of politics. Yeah, got it. Too. Got it. But you know, it's funny because I've gotten to know specialty teams and residents within those specialty teams really well. Like I have friends in urology now. Yeah. I have friends in ENT. And they'll call me every so often and curbside me. They're like, hey, listen, we have a patient that I don't think needs to go to medicine, but I'm struggling mm. with their insulin or uh, I'm struggling with their IV. Yeah. Is there anyone that could help? And, you know, you help them out and they help you out. And if We can we- be consulted? I had no idea. Well, those are more curbside. Got those it. are like okay. friends like, hey, what would you do? Yeah, I see. Can internal medicine teams be consulted? Yeah, they can absolutely. Be. Yeah. So uh, there's consults at Jefferson, which are non-teaching services. Got it. And then at... Penn State, where I went, there was a medicine consult team, and it was for exactly that. It was for surgical, um, usually surgical or subspecialty Mm. patients who maybe are are totally fine. They're not very medically complex to be on that service, except for maybe they're having an issue with their diabetes Mm -hmm. or their glucose management and could use some input. Got it. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. The counterpoint to that question always is, what is the worst thing? About internal medicine. I no hesitation. It's yeah. the hours. The hours. Yeah, okay. which is to be clear, yeah. not as bad as a lot of subspecialties. Mm-hmm. I am fully aware of that, but a lot of internal medicine programs still do twenty-eight hour shifts uh, in the ICUs, which we do. Um, we still do fourteen-hour shifts at night, um, and it, it's it was a lot easier as an intern. It was even easier last year. I think the further along I get, the more I'm like, okay, I'm ready, I'm ready. to be done with this now. Um, but you know, with those shifts comes the camaraderie. I've gotten to know a lot of the ICU nurses, especially the night nurses that I love working with. Last year when I was on nights around Christmas time, we did these big Christmas festivities. So, you know, it, it comes with the same good of the coworkers and being in Mm. this weird job together and getting to kind of celebrate these things together. So, you know, the, the, pros and the cons and there's cons and the pros. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's interesting. And talking about the hours, can you tell me about the difference in uh, work intensity from first year to second year to third year? Is this, is it, does it get easier? Does it get harder? What is, what is the difficulty like? Um, it gets easier in the nitty gritty yeah. in a lot of ways. So um, it get it gets easier by nature because you're more comfortable mm-hmm. with the medicine. Got it. Okay. So you don't have to spend as much time looking things up. You don't have to spend as much time worrying if you're coming up with the right plan. A lot of that stuff becomes second nature mm-hmm. and it becomes something you feel comfortable with and therefore faster. Got it. The things that get easier is that interns typically write all the notes. Mm-hmm. The interns typically do a lot of the grunt work. Mm-hmm. Um, they see all the patients in the morning before rounds, before the team sees the patients, mm-hmm. which maybe might be a little bit redundant, yeah. but that's that's the, the classic yeah. uh, model. As a senior, you don't have to do much of that. You're more of the project manager. You're mm-hmm. more of the overseer mm-hmm. um, of that work. I Different people have different styles. I try to be you know, as much of the team taking on nitty gritty tasks to just like spread out the workload, you know, make everybody's day a little bit better, get out of here a little bit sooner. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, uh, I think the hours are a little bit better. I don't have to get in yeah. work quite as early. So yeah, it does get easier. Can you tell me about the hours? What, what it would be an average day as an intern versus an average day as a PGY3? Sure. So an intern is in charge of getting sign out on all the patients from overnight. So okay. anything that happened with the team overnight was taken care of by the night shift, not the normal primary team. And so the intern comes in, talks to the night shift, finds out so-and-so needed an extra dose of this medication, so-and-so had a rough night uh, in these ways, and this is what we did. And once they get sign out, then they start seeing patients. Is it like 6 a.m., 5? That's around, that's between 6 and 6.30 usually because it's whatever amount of time you need to do that, chart check all the patients Mm -hmm. and see them in the morning and maybe get your notes done Mm -hmm. before you start rounds. Rounds almost always start around 8.30. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So, however, the nice thing is that you could kind of choose the amount of time that you need if you like to work at a little bit of an easier pace. Mm -hmm. Then you could get in a little bit sooner. If you um, are pretty 
efficient with all that stuff and you have a good system, then you could get in a little bit later. But you need to do those things before we round at 830. Got it. Got As it. a senior, I need to oversee what the interns are doing, be available to them if something happens in the morning and um, make sure I, I know everything that's going on with the patients. I don't have to see them in the morning. So that saves a ton of time. Mm. Um, I don't have to write notes in the morning, which saves a lot of time. So I really just um, chart check the patients and lay eyes on the ones that are pretty sick or mm -hmm. talk to the ones that I know are having a particularly hard time mm -hmm. and then prepare for rounds. So uh, my day usually starts around seven. Okay, cool. And then um, let's talk about an average day. So that so you did the beginning of the day and then you'll do rounds at 830. Talk us, to us about the, the glorious internal medicine the rounds. Infamous, the infamous internal, internal medicine, internal medicine rounds. rounds. Yeah. So internal medicine rounds, that is what makes internal medicine internal medicine. Yeah. So if you like to stand around outside patients' rounds for hours and talk about all of the in-depth details of what is going on in their care currently, what will be going on in their care tomorrow, and what they'll need in the long term, internal medicine is the specialty for you. If you don't like doing that, it might not be uh, as good of a fit. However, we are moving a, a further away from that model. Actually, COVID really kind of threw a wrench in that. It depends on what your attending preference is. But um, during COVID, we used to what we call table round a lot more often where we would limit the number of people that went from room to room to limit the spread of COVID and start off by talking about patients at a table just like this one and going through those same points but doing it with computers in front of all of us so we all had the information in front of us it wasn't as formal as the uh infamous presentation student presentation oh, God. um and therefore wasn't as long and it ended up being a much more efficient model and then since the interns have already seen the patient then the uh attending could take the interns and students with them to go see the sickest patients and then go see the rest of them in the afternoon. Um, I do know from talking to a lot of my friends who are in uh, their attending years now that I know it's more efficient for um, attendings to see all the patients in the morning with the team and do the more traditional rounding structure because they only have to see patients once a day. They've seen their patients. They could write their notes and kind of wrap up the, the tasks that they need to do for the day, which leaves time for teaching or whatever. Um, residents tend to like table rounds more because they can put these, the orders in, they could order whatever medications that they need or labs right then and there while they're talking about the patient um, and not have to write it down as a list and then do it after round separately. Um, there's really good hybrid models of both, I think, tend to work out the best. What will you do as an attending? <sighs> Probably a hybrid model. I would, uh, I, I want to say as a resident, like, I'm going to table around. Yeah. But it, I've heard from my friends that everything changes when the buck stops with you. Mm -hmm. And so being open to to knowing that I probably don't have all the answers right now of what actually works and what doesn't. But I definitely want to prioritize um, residents' schedules and, and days. So I, I don't want to wax poetic on rounds yeah. and keep them there forever for the sake of hearing my own voice and uh, make them late for a conference or late to finish their tasks. I, I definitely don't want to be that person thank you no that'll be that, i think that's that's a good answer we everybody knows that yeah the, the kind of rounds that i'm yeah, talking about yeah yeah we know we know i even as i mean <laughs> luckily fourth year i'm having a very relaxed time fourth year is awesome fourth as you can see great. i can do things like this yeah um but the but i remember third year i remember those rounds i remember those rounds so in regards to each different year can you tell me like do you have a favorite year of residency or is it kind of like they're all good in different ways i gotta i like second year a second lot. year yeah. okay Second year, I knew the ropes. Yep. I could uh, work within the system well because I knew it. Um, I wasn't excessively tired or yeah. burnt out yet. Third year has been nice for the same reasons, except a lot of my friends who I worked very closely with, mm -hmm. we are now very much on our subspecialty tracks and career mm -hmm. tracks. I don't 
overlap with him very much anymore. Um, I I rarely see them in the workplace. Like, mm. I mean, obviously we make time for each other outside of work, yeah. but um, there's a lot less of the camaraderie at work, the hanging out at work, which, you know, has its benefits. I can yeah. hang out at home more yeah. <laughs> often. But um, I, it felt like the uh, my second year was the most, like, resident experience. Mm, I see. Okay. And then in regards to outpatient time, what's, like, an average day, like, in the outpatient? So here is, we're at four plus one, correct? Or what? Are, four plus two. Four plus two. Okay. Mm -hmm. Jefferson's four plus two. That's great. That's good to know, actually. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but we're four, we're four plus two. Um, well, let me tell you, the two yeah. is key because yeah. then you get, it's about the amount of the weekends. weekends. Yeah. The weekends. Mm -hmm. yeah, no, that is, a, that is a major key. So during those two, what is an average day like for the two, the outpatient days? So a lot of that time is usually spent in your continuity clinic. Got it. Every internal medicine program will have one. It's your patient panel that you will follow from the beginning of intern year to the end of your third year. Some people have a larger patient panel than others. I I happen to have a larger one, and I have very loyal patients. So I will see those patients pretty much every plus two. I know their health really well. I am their primary care doctor. That's cool. They trust me, and... I have a really good relationship with them. And I know how their family's doing. I know how their brothers are. I know I know a lot about who they are as people, which is pretty special and also helps with, you know, decision making. Um, and it's a nice experience because you go in, you already know what the plan is. If their blood pressure is this, then I have this medication already in mind. Mm -hmm. um, that those clinics usually are a pretty typical eight, eight thirty to five day. Mm -hmm. And clinics just like any other primary care office is not open on the weekends. Mm -hmm. It's not open on holidays. Yeah. So if those blocks happen to fall during holidays, then you have off. That's pretty good. Yeah. That's it's like a, a normal work day. Yeah. 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 That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. And how many weekends during the four are you working on the weekends? So every program is different. Yeah. And I encourage you and your listeners yeah. to ask about this. Yeah, okay. This is a big point. Got it. Um, so the way that we do it mm. is that in a four-week block, you get one full weekend off. You work one full weekend, which is called a black weekend. Mm. A golden weekend is when you have both days yeah. off. And then you do a silver and gray where you work either the Saturday or the Sunday and have the other day off. Got it. Okay. So that ends up being four worked weekend days and four weekend days off, Got which it. we know well ahead of time. So I know what weekends I have off in the spring Wow. and can plan for that. And having weekends off are much different than having weekdays off when, you know, other people don't have that weekday yeah. off. Now, some programs that I looked at did... Everybody on the team gets together and they just divide. They pick what day that week they want off. Mm, and they I get see. that day off. And there's nice things about having weekdays off. You can go to the dentist. You could get your hair done. Yeah. Um, but, you know, not a lot. Not everybody has weekdays off. Significant others don't yeah. have weekdays off. So um, I found the structure that we have to be a little bit more conducive to non-resident lifestyles yeah yeah no that that's helpful that's helpful to go tough question here if i was to give you i want you to picture yourself three years in the future okay so you've been practicing as an attending for three years i give you a hundred million dollars tax-free it's in your bank account you don't report it to anyone anything like that you have four options option number one is you continue working full-time of course who knows what you're going to think but i just want you to picture yourself there uh, you, you work part-time, you change careers entirely, or you go live in a beach somewhere and, you know, drink mimosas. All right. What would I do? Yeah. I would uh, I would continue working full-time. Full-time. Maybe, maybe 80%. Got it. Okay, yeah. 80%. I would continue working as a physician. Now, hopefully in three years or five years, I will— my my time won't be fully clinical. I'm really yeah. hoping for a career where I'll do be doing partially teaching and um, a little bit of medical education leadership and as well as clinical work. And um, I will certainly buy the beach house yes. with that money. <laughs> so the beautiful thing about hospital medicine, which we didn't talk about, is that classically it's one week on and one week off. So I'll have my beautiful Kate, Kate May 
Shore House. Yeah. Um, for those of you that live in the Philadelphia yeah. area, know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, and I can live my my week off there and then come back and I would certainly still work. That's fan- That's a good thing to point out because very few other specialties, I'm trying to think if anyone has a deal like this, you work a week on and then you work a week off. Yeah, so the statistics... And it's the weekends. You might not even work on the weekends of that week, right? No, you do. Oh, you do. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice try, but you do. So those statistics that you mentioned... Yeah. You're good. Uh, the statistics that you mentioned in the beginning of internal medicine, salary, especially yeah. as a generalist, right? Yeah. So I keep mentioning cardiologists, gastroenterologists, nephrologists, they're all going to have different salary points and yeah. averages. So as a generalist, um, a hospital structure, working one week on, working one week off, that salary is, is for that structure. So mm-hmm. if... You know, if I wanted to, I can moonlight yeah. on the weeks that I'm not working yeah. and supplement that salary, yeah. um, which I will probably do in the beginning of my career if able so that yeah. I can kind of work towards the my medical school debt. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I moonlight now. Wow. Um, but I, uh, I think it's really, really special because it gives you time not only to decompress the diastole to the systole yes. of working in the hospital— but also, um, it gives you time to work on projects, right? Like, write if you like to write. Research if you like to research. Because I don't think very many of us are are one-note are one note people. Like, there's always an interest plus that brings us to medicine. And even if, if it's not, maybe it's the interest plus family. Yeah. Or maybe it's that you really love being the best clinician you could be. Well, you could, you know, read up on that on your week off. So. Yeah. There's there's a lot of things that you could do to supplement your career or really just totally take a step back from it. I think that's kind of special. It's an, I think it's a huge thing to think about too because I'm I'm thinking about this now going into residency. Actually, I'm like, okay, we get paid this much, but we're working this many hours a week. Oh my god, our hourly rate it's is not, not that very great. Much, yeah, and that's why across the country you're yeah. starting to see residents unionized. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. And then and then also. But just applying it to an IM attending, right? If you're thinking, okay, this seems like a decent amount under average. Well, think about maybe you're working half as much as some other physicians, right? Because you're doing the week off. So you can kind of factor that into play. And to talk about the second point you mentioned, which having diverse interests and stuff like that. When I've spoken to attendings here, when I've spoken to residents, it seems the happiest ones are the ones that are doing lots of different things. The ones that are doing teaching. They're doing research. Uh, There's one guy that's a writer as well, and he spends time writing and stuff like that. And they've kind of slowed not gone narrower in their field, whatever they're doing, their specialty, for example, a cardiothoracic surgeon or something like that, they're actually starting to spread out a little bit. Maybe they're spending more time teaching a class or more time doing research or going to conferences. And they seem to love that. They seem to like that a little bit more than just become, of course, if you want to be the best, you know, cardiothoracic surgeon in the world that specializes in lobectomies, right? You need to do thousands of lobectomies or something like that. But a lot of them don't. A lot of them spread it out. So I think that's an important thing to point out that when wherever you go, you don't have to just be an internist or just be a hospitalist. You have your interests in these curriculum things and you've done writing as well. And I think it's a great and important thing to think about as you go through. Well, I think the best clinicians are humanists. Yeah, yeah. Right? We get into medicine for love of the person. Yeah. And all that person is and all the things that make humanity great and what make humanity struggle at times. And... I think reflecting on that and our place in that um, as healers, as people who interact with folks at the worst moments of their lives, I think that that feeds a different part of ourselves. It, it feeds our our souls in a lot of ways and, and it, it frames medicine differently. And that's why it's been important to hold on to that for yeah. me. Yeah, no, it, it's, it makes complete sense to me. So... As someone who's in internal medicine, I feel like sometimes there are only certain things you can know when you're in it. So what is something you wish you knew before going into internal medicine? Or maybe something that you found out or something you experienced that you thought, wait a second, I had, I didn't think this would be a part of being an internal medicine doctor, internal medicine resident. Is there anything like that? That's a good question. I, I think I didn't realize how much um, social sciences and social work plays into internal medicine. Got it. I didn't realize, I knew that I'd be working with families, sometimes difficult ones, sometimes grateful ones. I knew that I would be working on barriers to discharge and the dispo issues that we had talked Mm -hmm. about. 
I didn't realize how much I would be on the phone with insurance companies mm. getting prior offs. I didn't realize how much I'd be doing peer to peers. I didn't realize how much I would be navigating getting coverage for various medications that I know are the best choice for the patient. And I have to tell a claims person who has no medical background on the other side. I don't, I don't know how much other specialties deal with that. I imagine not as much since mm -hmm. we're usually the Point overseers people. of the care. Yeah. But it's, it's frustrating and it's, it's a big part of our, medical structure which is part of why i've been involved in policy because yeah. it's that's all directly affected by yeah. policy yeah another thing what do you think are the characteristics of a medical student that would excel in internal medicine mm -hmm. if so, they're so maybe if someone's in in medical school and they're not really sure the specialty but you know they're, they're like i'm a really resilient person or i love to do research on the side or for example i don't know i love to I don't know. I'm thinking of random things here. But you know, are there certain characteristics of someone that would excel in internal medicine? Yeah, it's people who are curious. Yeah, okay. I actually love it. I always ask when a student starts with me what they're interested in. I had a friend once. He's an orthopedic surgeon yeah. now. And he used to tell me when we were med students together, he's like, whatever subspecialty I was on, that's what my career was going to be. <laughs> so if I was on psych and they asked me what I wanted to do, I wanted to do psych. Okay. And it was an interesting strategy. I really... Love it when students are honest with what they want to do because um, I can try to curate the patients that they follow to whatever it is they're interested mm -hmm. in. And once I do that, once I show interest in what they want um, and we're and we're working well as a team and they're enthusiastic about, hey, I might not want to do internal medicine, but I want to absorb everything I can while I'm here mm -hmm. because this might be the last time I ever do it. Um, I think that's when that's when the team really flies. Some of the best students I've ever worked with had no interest in internal medicine, but they were uh, excited to be there. Um, they took ownership over their patients, which is huge, like really caring about their patients' needs, having because students have the the benefit of time, mm -hmm. right? They're not carrying twelve patients um, and overseeing all these tasks necessarily. So circling back and checking in on their patients to see how they're doing, being that go-between for the um, whole team and the patient, I, I, those those almost always define um, exceptional students. And then obviously it's a bonus if um, they're clinically exceptional, but I, I don't hold them to it. I see that them where they are is to learn, right? Yeah. Like I don't expect them to have all the answers, they wouldn't have to do med school or residency if they did. I don't have all the answers. And yeah. we're all going to be lifetime learners. But someone who, even if they don't know, are um, willing to look it up or willing to be a willing participant in the educational process, yeah. you know? It's such a tricky spot. I'm trying to, I'm because I, I remember my third year of medical school when they ask you, what, uh, what specialty are you interested in going into? What do you think you're going to go into? And you're like... Hmm, I really don't want to go into neurology, but I'm not going to say. That. So my strategy was, I was like, I'm not really sure yet. I find this really, really interesting. That was my strategy in third year. But it was, it's such a weight off your shoulder in fourth year. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I was doing sub eyes. I was doing different rotations. And I just tell, like I did a radiology uh, in, or clinical, exp whatever, that's rotation the mm -hmm. other month or something like that. And they're like, what are you interested in going into? And I was like, oh, internal medicine. They're like, okay, this will be helpful, blah, blah, blah. Right. We see the bit. And, and I wish... Students could say that, but the problem, it's just such a fear that you're going to be like graded a little bit worse mm -hmm. or something. Maybe not as much with residents. With residents, you know, there's a little bit more comfort, but especially attendings. It's kind of just like, That's I have true. to say, I kind of feel like I want to go into their field because when I, the way I thought about it, and maybe this is a, a pointless tangent, but I thought, this is this person's entire career, and I'm saying that I really don't care that much about that career. It's it's this whole game that you play in your head, and I think it's a lot of no, medical I, students. No, I remember that game. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'll feel differently next yeah. year. Yeah. Than that's any, I don't think so. Yeah. I I feel like if someone is offended that they don't want to go into their subspecialty, there's there's a little bit of ego there. A hundred percent. But um, but who knows if the attending has the I, ego? Right? It's that's true. The, it's true. And the, you have to play that. You have to play the game. You have to play in the field. It's such a annoying game. But as a fourth year, there's no 
hiding it. Yeah, exactly. Right? The fourth and it year doesn't great. matter anymore because yeah. you're, everything is submitted. Yeah. Like you're just here to get what you can yeah. out of it. I, it feels that way, honestly, in third year where I have nothing left to prove, right? My applications for jobs are in. My application for fellowship is in. And I'm just here to to get everything I can out of it before I go. It's, it's a similar feeling. Yeah, yeah. No, it's great. Fourth year is fantastic. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. So... If you are a second or third year medical student and you're trying to decide a specialty and you're thinking about IM, but you're not sure, do you have any advice for them how they could kind of make this final decision and come to the decision? Hmm. So I would say experience as much as you can, including non-internal medicine rotation. So uh, be that person that when you have the opportunity to go watch a surgery or go to the endo suite for a procedure, Go and watch it because it, it it's otherwise you're you're basing this off of rumors of what a career might look like. I TV shows a lot of times, you know, I've heard people say like, oh, I really liked house, which is why I'm yeah. interested in internal medicine. Well, you know, we don't typically break into people's homes to figure no. out if they have like neurosister psychosis. <laughs> it's just like it's you don't know until you you know, yeah. until you're there and you get to experience it. So it, it really is try to diversify your um, clinical experiences as much as possible. Yeah. Um, and if you are someone who does like to really think deeply about how things uh, interplay, how different organ systems interplay, and patients' um, broader picture, then internal medicine might be something you want to think seriously about. And how can medical students say they know for sure they want to go into internal medicine? How can they be the most competitive possible when applying to residency? So uh, one thing that I wish I did when I applied to residency a little bit better was um, selling the unique parts of who you are. So I thought that it was about the most publications you had, the best letters that you have, but really it's about who you are uniquely um, and how you'll fit into that program. So I didn't talk as much about my love of humanities and my love of policy and advocacy. I certainly included it, but I could have pitched myself a little bit better as I have these specific and unique backgrounds that not a lot of other applicants will have. And that's what makes me special. I just, I actually downplayed a lot of that, mm. both as a applicant to medical school and um, an applicant to residency because I thought I needed to be more sciencey. And it took a little bit too long to realize that who I am is is pretty unique and is good enough. And if who I am doesn't work for the residency, then it's not my residency. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. And did you change it with the uh, job applications? You've put out the... Uh, I, I put it out. Good. Yeah. Okay, good, good, good. I'm <laughs> I glad. put it out there, yeah. I'm glad. So we'll see. I mean, yeah. we're, we're trying a new strategy, yeah. so stay tuned. I sound, I like that strategy. I yeah. think it sounds good. I think um, similarly, I'm actually... I had an interview today, for example, for internal medicine. And I think what I've seen a lot of times is I really struggled in my head whether I want to put the YouTube stuff and kind of the mm-hmm. podcasting stuff in my application And I put it in and I put it at the front and I think it's helped me a lot. I think it's people just talk to me about it. I I haven't had an interview yet where someone didn't ask me, what's this whole YouTube thing about? Because I think it's different. Zach, I I, I bet you have the best interview set up (laughs) too. (laughs) (laughs) The sound's good. (laughs) The lighting's great. I (laughs) I didn't interview over Zoom, but I'm doing it now for jobs. Uh And the first time I did it, I realized like, oh, the lighting here is rough. (laughs) 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 I bet that you are the Best well Thank lit. you. Yeah, it's, I, 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 I put a lot into it because I figured if I'm doing that, then I have to say this. I have a, I have a special key light there, you know. Mm-hmm. I have this microphone exactly hooked up, but it's at a position where you can't see it. I have the camera right above the center. This is a whole, this yeah. is a whole other thing. It's, no, but see, it's, uh, it's important. But it's, yeah. It really is. Like, it's how you present yourself. Yeah. No, it's, it's usually important. It's usually important. So gen- backing up generally more. Questions as we near the end. I think we have about 10, 15 minutes left. I like to find out kind of more general lifestyle tips, general things, because medicine and residency is not touted as the most easy on a person's life, right, career, right? So do you have any tips or any advice or things that seriously change the way you act? Kind of, it could be career, lifestyle, finances. It could be anything. Just as you are finishing up your training to be a doctor. Yeah, I've changed a lot 
in residency, for better or for worse. Um, hopefully, residencies moving forward aren't going to be as difficult as my first year was. Because I started during COVID in 2020, um, we weren't allowed to spend time together. Like We weren't allowed to hang out as a residency mm. class because there was fear that if one person got COVID, it would spread really mm. quickly. Um, and that was kind of isolating. And, you know, there's also a lot of patient loss that first year that I haven't really had to experience since, thankfully. So I, what the change that happened as a result of that, I, I think for the better, really did help me develop resilience. For the worst, I lost a lot of um, the the hobbies that made me happy. Like I used to be a pretty avid runner. Um, I used to participate in some local team sports activities. And I just, one, I couldn't because it was, mm. sh everything was shut down. And two, I didn't feel like I had the time or I would justify not having the time by catching up on sleep or reading up on things. I think if I could do it again now, and especially for those of you who get to start residency where the world isn't shut down, um, really building those priorities into your life as priorities and not as bonuses, uh, I think is important to, to hang on to, to who you are. Because now, out of the habit of, of doing the things that I really enjoyed, I, I have to work a little bit harder to work them into my day to build back the the habit of running again regularly. Um, but it's it's coming back. It's definitely like the light at the end of the tunnel. I am the the ramp up to going into residency and the slowly taper off as I go back into like a, a normal work schedule. I, I'm certainly starting to do that, which is good. Yeah. And it sounds like hopefully you'll definitely have time in the internal medicine world. On the week off. On the week off, right? Yeah, got a week off. The week off. That'll be... That'll, but you do say you might moonlight, though. But you can do maybe one moonlight week, one week off where you do the fun stuff. That that sounds good. Right. Are there any mistakes that you see either your colleagues or even attendings making in their career? And again, it's in the same vein. It can be lifestyle. It can be career in the hospital. It could be personal life. Anything. Yeah, I think not knowing the value of the word no... Got it. Is, is, ...is a big mistake. So... I used to think that, um, and still do a lot of times, like this is not a big, like I have found all the answers. Um, this is things that I try to get better at. Yeah. But um, when asked to participate in a project or asked to take on an extra role, especially, especially women, I've, like, it's very easy to be asked, like, hey, do you mind being in charge of the wellness committee? Or do you mind being in charge of the party planning committee? Or can you plan so-and-so's baby shower? Those are, are very benign questions. They're they're all always well-intentioned. They are very time-consuming, and they don't have a career benefit. Mm. So... I am trying to get, and even, even things that have a career benefit that either don't help your specific career trajectory that you just don't have an interest in or you don't have time to do, to be able to prioritize the things like your own wellness, your running, your whatever, um, being able to say, hey, I just don't have the bandwidth right now. I don't have the time that this project deserves. One thing that I try to do is... Those are both good answers, by the way. Like, key, I, I'm think Because I one I use a lot is saying, I don't have the bandwidth right now. So keep going, because these are these are great. One thing I try to do is, especially if it's a, it's a really interesting project, is be like, you know, I don't have um, the time that that project, I think, deserves, but so-and-so, I think, would be a great fit for it. There are publications that I passed on because I just couldn't dedicate the time for it. But I pass them off to a friend or colleague who took it and ran, you know? So it could be the best project in the world, but it, it might not work for you, but it still can work for someone. Mm. Um, but I do caution particularly women in medicine and in, in any field be careful with what you're asked to do and how it fits into your career. Because even before I went into medicine, I was put in charge of the party planning committee and my office space. And I had 
no particular interest in party planning. Mm-hmm. And it ended up being a lot of time-consuming yeah. meetings and had really no benefit to my career where I could have either been doing something for myself or taken on another project that would have actually been fruitful for me. So um, that's a that's a trap that I've uh, noticed, especially young career physicians and residents make. Yeah, and it's an important thought to make because what are you going to list on your resume? I was the party planning you chair. Don't. You don't list that, No, right? but you might spend hours. Yeah on it. Yeah. 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 And it's important. I think even generally, it's a really important point because you have to think, what are the, what is the reason I'm doing this? Right. I think I, something I wish I started thinking about earlier. Why am I doing all these things? Why am I going through the four years of undergrad in biomedical engineering? Why am I doing the three years of medical school? Why am I planning to do the six years of gas of, of internal medicine and gastroenterology? Mm-hmm. It's something that I think I wish I thought about sooner because it helps kind of solidify your plans and it helps also potentiate the things you're doing. So for example, maybe I'm doing research and I just try to find research. Well, if I know I want to GI, do GI, maybe I should do some GI research, right? Mm-hmm. That might make more sense to me as opposed to doing HIV or AIDS research or something like that. So I think it's a great point that can be applied broadly. On the other side of things, are there things you admire about colleagues, about attending physicians or clinicians or even residents or chief residents, Something people that you look up to and are there characteristics they have, things they do, things about them that you're like, wow, I want to be a doctor like this person or I just want to live my life like this person? I love the doctors that say they don't know. Yeah. I love it on rounds when an attending says, you know, I'm not really sure. Yeah. I know this. And I know this, but I'm not sure about this. And uh, we can look it up together. Not, could you look it up and get back to me? (laughs) Like, we can look it up together. Because I think it's really dangerous when you set a tone that you have all the answers and that people are expected to have all the answers. One, I think it promotes folks that are a little bit less inclined to say when they they don't know something and and that could be certainly dangerous in patient care. But also I I think it it promotes like a more hostile is a strong word, but like hostile environment, competitive environment when really we're all just doing our best for the patient. Yeah. Um, I, I find that the attendings and residents who are quicker to say that are actually the ones that know the most and are just not insecure about, their place in medicine. Yeah, yeah. However, imposter syndrome is also a real thing. Mm-hmm. So just because if you feel that you don't know enough or you don't belong there, that also is almost always a sign that you do. And it, it's just those feelings that creep in with everybody that we have to we have to be careful not to get the best of us and take control. So there's two sides to that coin, but I really do love it when, when people say, oh, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah, know, another great point. If you don't know the answer, I think it, it's, it's almost, it also relays a kind of trust. I feel like if I'm a patient and, the, and I really have this dying, burning question and my doctor says, you know, listen, I really don't know the answer to that. It makes me feel like, okay, when he tells me something, I'm going to trust him for that. Because he says, I don't know for this thing, but he says, I know this X, Y, Z for this thing. So it makes me mm-hmm. even trust the doctor, I think, a little bit more from the other side. We're running out of time here, so I just want to know if there are any closing words, any closing thoughts. They can be in general. They can be towards people that are interested in internal medicine as a career or are thinking about it, anything at all. Um, I think just don't don't feel like you have to fit into a certain archetype of, of what you picture whatever specialty should be, right? So... A lot of the theme of today was if you like the humanities, if you like policy, if you like running, make space for that in your life, not as a separate bonus, but as a part of who you are and sell that for who you are, because that it's it's really the the human that is the doctor and it's the human that connects to the patient and not the the cardiac surgeon who has 10,000 publications. It's it's the father who connects with a patient who's also a father who can who can share that experience and just help help the patient through whatever it is they're going through i think that's really what makes the the best doctor yeah yeah perfect well thank you so much jill this has been great well thank you so much zach thanks for inviting me thanks for coming jill i appreciate it i'll see you in the hospital maybe yeah yeah (laughs) let me know how applications go i will thank you so much of course awesome that was great job that was great that was really great